Please give a warm welcome to uh, Stefan Jentsch for his talk, Migrating Existing Code Bases to Using Type Annotations. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Or Okay, um, let me know, otherwise I'll, I'll take the mic in the hand. Um, great to be here, thanks for having me. Um, first of all, like so many people do, at least from Yelp, uh, one short slide, Yelp is about connecting people to great local businesses. I know a lot of you have already talked to us at the booth. If you haven't, or if you wanna know more about Yelp, please come find us at the booth. We'll be here all day tomorrow as well. But I want to dive right into my talk and what I'll be talking about. First of all, what are type annotations and why should you use them? I'll promise this is going to be very short since this is not supposed to be one, like one of those extremely introductory type annotation talks, but I hope you already know something about them and you know you want to use them. I'll also be talking about how to incrementally migrate an existing code base to them. So in case you have a larger code base with at least tens of thousands of lines of code that you can't just fully type annotate in an afternoon or two, how do you want to go about it? Uh, and um, what are some tools that can help you do that? I'll also talk about some of the issues you might encounter while doing that. And lastly, I'll talk about how type annotations can help you when you talk across network boundaries. So across different repositories. I want to state right off the bat that I'm no expert by any means on type annotations. Um, I'm just talking about what I learned as a user of type annotations. So if you have tips or improvements, uh, let's talk afterwards, come find me. Uh, come find me at the booth, contact me by email or Twitter. And I want to mention also right off the bat, I'm going to show a lot of code uh, as uh, to illustrate my example, so if you're not a big fan of that, maybe go now, I'm thinking of you. And I'll start right off uh, with a code example, is a super, like, way too simplified code example. So a function, it takes a string argument and it returns a string, um, and then we call it with an integer, and it still, it still works, but if you then use the type checker, um, it tells you that uh, the arguments are incompatible. Now, I know it's an obvious mistake, and as I said, the code still works, so why is this a good example? Maybe it isn't. I think it is in the sense that on larger code bases, it's much less clear what data you're passing around, and um, Remember that um, one of the things uh, is, that is in the center of Python is explicit is better than implicit. So if it is okay to call this function with an integer, you should say so. So either your hello call is buggy or your type annotation is buggy. So, and uh, this is kind of like a, a big difference in in duct typing, not in the sense how like duct typing is, is structural typing, but in the sense that oftentimes I see code where we pass something in and then we kind of hope it works. Here we, we really need to be explicit and if we are not or if things don't match, we will get errors. So let's uh, talk about how to migrate a, a bigger code base, a legacy code base if you will, uh, to type annotations. Our goal is to at the end have all of the code be type annotated. Uh, and we want to distribute the task of annotating the code base since it's so much. And we'll do that by incrementally annotating code. So we improve the amount of annotated code while making sure we don't have any regressions. So people removing type annotations because they want to get rid of type, uh, like type checking errors. And we're going to do that on a per file basis. So whenever you commit a new file or you touch a file, you're going to have to annotate it if it's not annotated. People might not be super happy about that, but uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
We'll also want to make sure that we do have type checking for the whole code base for the code that is already annotated. And that is possible, although there are like a few limitations as to what checks can be performed, um, as, as we'll see in a bit. The tool we'll be using is MyPy, the Python type checker. It's the static type checker. It's kind of like a linter. You run it on your code base. Uh, I'll be talking mostly about the newest version that has been released just uh, three weeks ago. It's, it's beta quality, it, it works fairly well, and, but there's rapid progress and there's still like some issues, some bugs, uh, some things it doesn't quite check correctly yet. So expect whenever you upgrade to a newer version that you might have to do some uh, source code modifications. Uh, I'll also be using Python 3.6 syntax for the type annotations just because it's uh, so much uh, nicer of a syntax. And you might see on the tweet here it talks about uh, structural subtyping. I will be mentioning that a, a little bit during my talk. I haven't had time to dig into that yet, uh, so you won't see an example of that. So using MyPy, how do we enforce annotations? We do it with this configuration. The first uh, three things are basically what makes sure that unannotated code is an error. Um, we also say to not complain about issues in code that uh, is not, that we are not explicitly checking. So basically files we are not passing in as arguments for the linter. And we want to make sure we treat none correctly everywhere, since this is like a significant source of bugs, not only in Python, but in other languages too. So we want to make sure that either you, like everywhere you use a variable, it would work if it were none, or that basically through type annotations and through checks, we know that it cannot be none. MyPy actually has a like strict option, which um, sets a bunch of, of these arguments plus, or a bunch of these configuration options plus many more, you're going to have to make a, or strike a balance there between like cost and benefit since it's actually like fairly restrictive and has a lot of things that you then need to do um, and can actually like be quite difficult to do since like, especially like some decorators for example are are not always easy to annotate. Okay, so now we know um, how MyPy needs to be configured, but how do we use it? Well, um, luckily, Yelp has you covered. We open source already a while ago a tool called pre-commit. Um, basically, it allows you to configure and um, provides a bunch of pre-commit hooks you can run when, when yeah, well, when committing. Um, and they can do a lot of different things. It has a lot of uh, pre-configured hooks for many different languages. And since we are a big user, a heavy user of Python, the Python, uh, the Python support is, is very good. So what we'll do is we create a dot pre-commit config.yaml file in our project root directory, and we configure the MyPy linter. And what we do here is basically we point it to a custom configuration file which basically contains uh, the, the configuration I showed you a couple of slides earlier. And then we tell MyPy to use that and you can see in the line below, uh, we check basically every Python code in the, in the package or library or service that we are, um, that we are configuring here. Remember that this is only for files that you changed when you commit. So this is not for every file. It's always filtered by the files you're committing. And we're excluding things like test files and, and other utility scripts that maybe where you don't want to have this like strong restriction. What you also want to do is make sure everybody has these pre-commit hooks installed. This is the command to do it. Ideally, you run it in form of like when you set up the development environment. If you don't have that, maybe like when you run tests, something that developers do all the time. So how does it look when you, when you run 
uh, those hooks. This is an example. You can see at the bottom here, I modified the file media.py and our pre-commit hook informs me that I forgot to fully annotate two functions, a return type and, and an argument. I also passed a wrong argument to the get photos future um, class. And as you can see further up, there's like many more hooks that you can run and uh, to improve code consistency, code quality. Note though that this is not a foolproof solution. Obviously developers are able to skip either individual pre-commits or like running the pre-commit hook at all. So um, make sure people don't do that and that you, know, you, you catch that if it happens. But we also wanna type check code as part of make test or whatever you do to run, to run tests. We'll use a simplified and much less strict configuration for that. Uh, for example, it's totally okay to have non-annotated code in this case. All you have to realize is that um, as you mix annotated and non-annotated code, for example, when you, when you have a function that's not annotated and returns something, that type internally is any. It fits everything. So even if you then pass that return value to another function that is annotated, uh, MyPy, the type checker, will never complain. So that means that in the beginning, even when, like when you start annotating your larger code base, you might not notice much of an improvement in terms of like bugs it catches or prevents, if you will. Uh, you just need to keep at it and add type annotations and um, the value will, will come as you reach a certain level of, of lines of code that you annotated. One thing like my colleague mentioned earlier today actually in this room is to type your data. This I feel is super important and for me personally is the most valuable part of type annotations. So yes, it's great if you can say like this is a string or an int, but oftentimes we pass around larger data structures. Oftentimes it's dictionaries and oftentimes bugs happen because we pass around these opaque dictionaries and we don't really know what's in there. Even worse, these dictionaries are mutable, so people change them. So even though you dug through the code and you think you found where this dictionary was created and you know what's in there, you missed that there was this other function in between that modified it. And yeah, I'm sure you, many of you know this and it's, it's a pain to deal with. So name tuples are a great way to solve that problem. It, they define your data contract. As you can see, you can um, type each field here and they're immutable so you prevent people from modifying the data. And you can see you can nest definitions even. So in this case, I, I, I don't show the photo but a photo is a name tuple as well. So, you know, you can easily create your nested data structures and all of it will be typed. But in some cases, maybe you cannot or you don't want to, um, use name tuples, you need dictionaries. Good thing is, nowadays this is relatively new and it works really great. You can type dictionaries as well. And unlike dictionaries or they may be called maps or hash maps in other languages, in Python we can have um, strongly typed dictionaries, well, in, in the sense that the type checker knows about them, based on the key name so we can each each value in the dictionary can have a different but known type based on the key name. And we even, we can, but we don't have to use those classes in our code. So in this example, I actually like instantiated a dictionary using this type dict class. This is possible, but not even necessary. All you need to do is that when your function gets a dict as an argument or it returns a dict that you use this type annotation of your type dict and then it will be checked accordingly. And MyPy will protect us from a class of uh, pretty insidious bugs that um, are really hard to catch because they don't cause an, an, an exception. Your code does seem to work, it just doesn't do the right thing. So in this case, I misspelled address two but the code works, 
I will just always, every time, get the empty string. But since I type my dictionary, and again, this would work even if I just used the type annotation for a function argument instead of like instantiating it like this, MyPy will tell me that there is no key address to, and I will find this bug without having written a single line of test code. So hopefully it's clear now why it's a good thing to type your data. So let's help uh, developers use that everywhere and uh, provide a small helper function that converts those dictionary, those opaque dictionaries into named tuples and then we have named tuples and from then on everything is great. So um, if we look at that uh, function, it basically instantiates um, oh, sorry. It instantiates uh, a named tuple instance from a class we, we get as an argument, and it uses the dictionary. Um, it uses the named tuple definition, the the attributes we define, the properties to look up values in the dictionary. So one thing that's missing is we we need to annotate this, which should be easy, right? Already went to the next slide. So this maybe I would call the first attempt. Uh, only three lines changed. Here we're getting um, a class, a named tuple class, so that's why we have to use this like type of named tuple. We get a dictionary and you can already see if we don't type our data like yes, I know this dictionary like all the keys are strings but I don't really know about anything about their values. But anyway, I'm using the name tuple, so afterwards I will know, and that is what counts, and we return a name tuple instance. Unfortunately, this doesn't really work, uh, which you can see here the first error. We actually need the information which name tuple it is we're returning. We, don't, we, we need to know what it is. I'll also talk a little bit more on the next slide about the second error, which is a little bit a different thing. So, we read up on how generics work, how you use that to type annotate your code, and we use that here. So this is this line, I introduced a new type bar, it's named struct, the name is not really important. The important part is that it's bound to name tuple, this means that it needs to be, like it can be more or less anything, but it needs to be a subclass of name tuple. And then we use it here, and the important difference to the code on the last slide is what this tells us. It tells us we get a class of some type, this struct type, and we return an instance of the same type. So now if I pass in my business name tuple as a class attribute, um, the type checker will know that I return an instance of that and we'll have it properly annotated. Unfortunately, this doesn't work either. Um, the reason here, like it actually tells you like, um, it, can't, like it can't map my business class, it, it doesn't fit the restriction I, I set for the struct type. The reason for this is that named tuple is, is a bit of a special case, so named tuple is not a type, it's a type constructor. It returns a class, but it's not a class itself, which is why we're running into these issues, and which is why MyPy, the type checker, actually needs to, like, does some special handling for named tuples. So the solution in the end looks almost the same, uh, but frankly, we just need to remove the bounding. It still works, but now, uh, what we don't know about anymore are those underscore make and underscore fields um, methods and attributes because those are actually defined by the name tuple base class that doesn't really exist. So we need, like, MyPy will complain that uh, I'm, I'm calling something that it has no knowledge about and so we need to use this like type ignore comment to silence the type checker. 
So we lost the knowledge basically about the fact that they all inherit from some base class or have the same base functionality. Um, but the important part we have. So this will work and will like transport the knowledge that what we get is a, is a business instance as a result. Yeah, if you want to read more about this, there's an, um, there, there's the MyPy issue about it. The structural subtyping should help in this case. Um, it requires quite a bit more code because basically you have to define the behavior yourself, but it should be possible to actually now fully uh, type this correctly. I just haven't had the time to, to try it out. Speaking of name tuples, one of the other things you might run into is this. So while there is no name tuple base class, they are all tuples. And tuples have count and index methods. So if you do try to define this uh, sort of name tuple, MyPy will actually complain to you about this because it does not allow you to redefine in subclasses attributes. Um, yeah, just, just something you should be aware of. And speaking of, of, of this strict type checking, um, we ran into this issue with, well, it's meta classes, probably shouldn't use them, but we were using them and um, all of this is an expression of, of this like behavior or duct typing. So in this case, um, the bottom class is a subclass of the top class and the registry attribute has a different type, but it has the same behavior. But still with uh, nominal typing, which is like the standard typing up to this point for MyPy, this is not supported. Uh, structural subtyping should help with this. If you're interested about it, here's the error again. It's basically the same error we saw in the name tuple case. Um, there's the pep. Again, it might, it might already be able to, to, to get it working. I haven't tried it yet. One more thing I'd like to mention um, is descriptors. If you happen to work with uh, descriptors, uh, this is an example. It's basically a descriptor that allows you to set a property on an object once, and then you can read it, but never set it again. Um, you need to actually like uh, use also the generic support to, to annotate this here. Um, T is the type of the object that, that will be using the descriptor, and V is the type of the value. Um, the little bit tricky part here is the dunder get method, since um, instance can be none, which is why we have to use this like optional of, of T. And in that case, the, um, the descriptor returns itself, so that's why we have to use this union of either we return the value or an instance of the descriptor. Um, and the set uh, method is where we implement the functionality, so you can see it here. I've, I've left obviously something out, but if somebody already set the value, we, we raise an attribute error. And you can see down here where we define the attribute, the biz user ID, uh, we specify the two types, and the second type is, is the type of the value, so at this point, MyPy knows that bizUserID is of type int, and even though like we use all that code above to deal at, with setting and getting, type checking will work correctly in this case. So why did I explain all of this? Because this is not something that is in the documentation for MyPy. Here is the issue about documenting descriptors. So the support is in there, but if you look for it, you might not find it in the documentation, but it does work and it works well. One thing that doesn't work well is recursive types. So let's say you have some tree-like structure. Uh, in this case, very simple, a category, it has an ID, a name, and it has a children, again, categories. You'll get an error. Um, I don't know of any solution to this. I think with tree-like data structures, they will be mostly untyped. You can get around with it that whenever basically you, you retrieve one of the children, you use uh, the cast operator to assign a type to it, but it's still, like currently it's not supported in MyPy. There's, there's the ticket, 
it's open for quite a while. I assume it's not easy to solve. Now, let's take a step further. Um, despite the limitation I mentioned, that I mentioned to show you that, um, you know, not everything will work well immediately and there are some restrictions. I'm obviously a big fan of type annotations and I think we can take them a step further. So, um, if you have a large legacy code base, chances are that you have started to invest maybe in a service-oriented architecture, so split up your code and you know, have it talk over the network. Um, we at Yelp certainly have, and I've, I've talked at, at past conferences about it. Um, and I've also spoken about how, um, like the challenges it poses in regards to reliability, in regards to testability with these code bases that get developed and deployed independently. So how do you know that your code change doesn't break anyone else's code and how can you make sure that um, you're using the new endpoint correctly? So if you look at that architecture, like obviously very simplified, we have our code and it calls these other services. So how can we gain confidence in our changes? Typically, like one solution has been to write end-to-end -end tests where you create these services in a test environment maybe and then, you know, you make real calls to them. This also means you might have to spin up the dependencies of these other services as well so it can get out of hand really quickly and, and my colleague, Loris, is actually talking in, in the other room about something that um, can help you with that, with spinning up service fakes, but uh, spoiler alert, you still need to launch another process, maybe in a Docker container, so it's better, but you know, it's, it's still a heavy-handed solution. So, how can type annotations maybe help us improve here? If you look at a service call, the way it happens at Yelp, but maybe also at, at other companies, we have an API specification that defines the contract the service offers, and we have a client library that based on that spec makes the API call, right? So what if we could use that spec to provide like quote unquote compile time checks? So, you know, like with our linter when we write the code. Let's take a look at such a spec. We're using OpenAPI at Yelp. Uh, it's kind of like JSON schema plus additions or changes. Um, the import, it's, it's not really important. The important part is that we define here an endpoint and a URL. Uh, it, it uses get, so it's basically, you know, JSON and, and REST and, and all of that. Not exciting in, in and in itself. Um, and here we define, like, we reference uh, what an open API called is a model, so an object that defines the response we return. So let's take a look at that, our business model. And we can see, obviously I've, I've shortened everything to make it fit here and, and remove things that are not important to the talk, but uh, this looks not too dissimilar to our name tuple definition, right? Um, or a type dict, if you will. The thing is, if you now take this and manually write those name tuple definitions or type dict definitions, first of all, that's not a lot of fun. Also, they are bound to get out of sync uh, as uh, endpoints are modified, new data is returned, and so on and so forth. So what we might want to do is we might want to generate those typed annotations. The spec already contains all of the information we need. We would just be duplicating it, so let's have the computer do it for us. What if we parse the spec, create, for example, name tuple types from it, classes, and then we also generate wrapper functions for each of the endpoints we define that are annotated using those stubs, I would call them. Now, how would that look like? So this would be or is uh, generated code, right? Well, I'll talk about the business future in, in just a second, but the business name tuple here is like a one-to-one -one mapping from the spec 
everything that is here is also in the spec, which makes sense because otherwise, how can we validate that you know we the the, the contract uh, is is being honored? Um, and then when we use it, like these are are the the generated at type annotated function I mentioned. So um, there's the get business future, which initiates the call and returns this business future object, which we then pass to the second function. So th the first function is non-blocking. It initiates the call and returns immediately. And we then pass the, the return value of the first function to the second function, which blocks until, uh, well, the res result is there, right? And you can see that it's uh, fully type annotated from start to finish. It even makes sure that what you pass to the second function is the result and only the result of the first function and nothing else. That's why we're creating this business future class and we're using it in the annotation here. Um, and, and you get these re structured response objects, right? So there's no chance of mistyping any field you're accessing. And modern IDEs like PyCharm, another sponsor here, actually provide you advanced IntelliSense and auto completion if you use that because it also reads the type annotations. Um, and all of this is checked and verified before you write a single line of test code across network boundaries, all thanks to you having a spec that defines the contract um, that you use. But obviously, you should still write tests because there's a bunch of code that is supposed to other, do other things, right? And um, let's take a look at that. So in this case, um, this is our example function. It uh, calls, like it, it uses our client library to make the calls. It um, and it returns uh, the review rating. So this is like our pre-code. This is how it looked like before we use um, our generated stubs and functions. And this is a test for it. Uh, I think should be relatively uh, clear. So here we're mocking out the result that is going to be returned over the network. We're using the, the mock module to create an object and we set the review rating. And um, yeah, at the end we assert, like we patch our client to set the return value. And then we assert that the review rating is what we set in the mock response. This actually doesn't like, it has a couple of problems. First of all, it doesn't catch the error that we're setting the mock data wrong. I don't know if you, if you noticed that, but for historical reasons, our aggregate review rating is a string. It's, it's a float value, but we send it over the wire. We define it as a string due to like older Python 2 versions having issues with, with floats. It's not important here, but that's how it's defined in the spec and we're mocking it as a float here. Our test passes, it's, it's fine. And uh, catching these types of errors requires, you know, to run integration tests where actually like all of the code is executed and you don't mock it and then you will notice. So how can our work help us identify these types of problems? Because at least at Yelp we have identified that such types of tests are not easy to write and they don't provide a lot of value because like you need to know that you mock it out correctly. You need to know that you have to like adopt your mocks as your service that you call changes. And so, you know, it has all of these issues that make the test not very helpful. So um, this would be the, our same get business review rating function that now uses our generated and annotated um, calls. So we chain it for simplicity, we create the future and we pass it directly to get business from future and we return business review rating. Um, now, this is what our test code looks like. So now we use one of our generated models like the name tuple to create the mock response in our case, actually, like we 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 use the mock, like the generated annotations, really only for 
type annotations. So we actually do create the types of objects that our client library returns, which are not named tuples. They just behave very similarly. But uh, that is a not important detail. Like it actually would work the same way if you, for, for the testing purposes, you would use the named tuples directly. So, and this actually provides, makes sure that uh, we provide type safe data. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit. So here you can see, <laughs> sorry, um, we have the same error um, and MyPy will complain about it. I know I'm, um, and the thing is, I haven't even type annotated the get business review rating because when you commit this, the type checker will tell you, you should annotate that function. Um, and it's actually much easier for you to realize, well, we really do want a float there. So you will annotate that function. It should have a float return value. And then MyPy will complain, hey, actually, like the business dot review rating is a string, not a float. And you will catch your error immediately. And for you to get the type annotation of this function wrong is much less likely than getting, uh, than you know, forgetting that actually we, tr like we use a string in our API contract. So the takeaways here, type annotations help you improve documentation and catch bugs earlier. Uh, with fine-grained type data structures, you gain a lot of insights into the data flow of your application that you might not have otherwise. It potentially reduces the number of tests you have to write and makes the tests you do write better. And yeah, like I said, it makes the test you do write more valuable. One thing I'd like to mention very quickly at the end is that it is additional work for everybody on your team or on your teams to ramp up on type annotations, providing type annotations when people think they've, they're done with their code and then the MyPy type checker complains. So make sure you tell everybody early and convince them that uh, type annotations are a great thing and that it's worth investing the time. So, um, check out our engineering blog. We're hiring. I'm out of time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Stefan, for that wonderful talk. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions as lightning talks will be starting downstairs in the main hall in five minutes. Thank you all for coming.